Thanks, that's very friendly and uh, thanks for the welcome, uh, particularly and uh, in general from all the organizations. And it's indeed really nice to see a full, full house on Afghanistan. So there's uh, still hope that we will not forget about a country which still will need some attention in the coming years and decades, I would uh, dare to say. <clears throat> Um, the the, the uh, issue I was uh, I'm supposed to talk about was given to me called the crisis in Afghanistan and, and the reasons behind uh, that of course cannot be done in 20 minutes so I <clears throat> do that try to do that relatively short and, and stick to things which are or have been happening now are happening uh, uh, in Afghanistan but also uh, broaden this a little bit because you cannot actually make a big distinction between crises or problems uh, we're facing now in Afghanistan and things which have happened uh, before, which would lead us uh, really to, to the reasons. Uh, but uh, just coming to my mind, if someone is interested really in the long-term perspective, I have written a paper which has the title began, so uh, um, it's not very long, uh, but I find it's one of my better ones, and um, um, I will not be able to pack that all into 20 minutes. Um, so, crises in Afghanistan, we can generalize a little bit uh, whether that's now a, a good definition or not, uh, I, I don't want to uh, discuss too long, but uh, what we definitely just had was an election-related uh, political crisis in Afghanistan, or a post-election uh, crisis, which uh, actually brought Afghanistan to the brink of uh, uh, outbreak of violence and uh, we can be very happy and Afghans can be very happy that uh, it didn't come uh, there. There were a lot of threats uh, in the air which, which made particularly Afghans, that's the perspective we, our organization, uh, prefers to take, uh, were really wobbly about and, and uh, afraid that it uh, might happen because it would not have been the first time that uh, different political actors, factions in Afghanistan would start fighting each other in uh, the civil wars of the 1990s, which one of the causes of conflict are still present in the minds of Afghans and also the causes which are behind these older crises uh, have uh, never been really, uh, 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 never went really out of the world. Um, but we also need to see that the electoral crisis, which in a way was an institutional crisis to which I, I uh, will come a little bit later uh, more in detail, are linked to longer term crises or problems. Uh, one would be, of course, the armed conflict in Afghanistan, which is continuing in different shape and different intensity over the last 35 years. Uh, uh, we have an economic and uh, social crisis, and there the word really is, uh, uh, we need to use that word, uh, because uh, um, Afghanistan is still, after all the investments of the last 12 years, one of the poorest countries uh, in the world, despite uh, progress which have been made on per capita income and, and things and, and uh, uh, people going uh, uh, to school and so on, but that's all still very shaky and the question mark is whether that's really sustainable in the long end. Afghanistan has something which the World Bank calls a financing gap, which means 20% uh, of all the bills which already now need to be paid in Afghanistan are actually not, not paid and uh, 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 they need to raise uh, funds for that uh, internationally, which then of course uh, will end up on our desks. Um, and then there's also a very long-term thing, and I just want to say one uh, a word about it. Afghanistan has been a rentier state for the last 150 years. It means they have used their strategic position, their geographical uh, location for uh, raising funds to, to run their state because economically, I mean, uh, and they have a lot of resources, but they're not, not using them in agriculture and mining and so on. Uh, but they were able to profit from the colonial expansion of then the Russian Empire and the British Empire, later the Cold War, and then the War on Terror, uh, uh, where they always were kind of in a, in a key position and they could say, we are important for you, so please uh, fund us. So that's also part of the thing that, that also has created a mentality from which it's very uh, difficult uh, to get out and that uh, uh, makes a lot of headache for people who think about economic and social programs uh, for Afghanistan because actually uh, the resources which are there now need to be uh, developed uh, by Afghans themselves and uh, I mean that will be a very long term uh, process. But let me come back to that uh, kind of latest uh, crisis which in comparison then uh, is, is smaller, this electoral uh, crisis. I mean we had uh, presidential elections for the third time after the Taliban regime uh, was toppled. Uh, it was the first election after Mr. Karzai who has been at the top of the state for uh, almost 13 years, first interim 
transitional authority and then uh, two terms as uh, president. And not everything went well uh, under him uh, for a lot of reasons which we cannot pack into uh, 20 minutes. Um, so that also in Afghanistan there was the feeling uh, probably it's good if we have a new president uh, and that at least we can have a new start, although many Afghans also would not go out and say many bad things about uh, President Karzai uh, because he also has uh, done a couple of things for which he not always gets uh, uh, credit. Um, so also there's a very ambivalent uh, balance if we look at uh, the performance of that government and uh, also the performance of the international community in, in cooperating with him or sometimes also having difficulties in cooperating with him. Um, so we had this election uh, in two rounds. Uh, first round, a lot of optimism. We had uh, eight candidates uh, in the end and uh, uh, People were looking forward to have really a choice because in early elections, Karzai always was a favorite and almost uh, sure to win. Um, now that was uh, uh, diversifying to a large extent and, and something which is always uh, uh, said about Afghanistan that you think in ethnic categories and so on, Pashtuns, non-Pashtuns, north-south. We saw that that was starting to dilute, that uh, uh, people from one ethnic group would go for a candidate from another ethnic group, that uh, tickets uh, would be mixed, and that particularly the young, urban, uh, better educated people said, uh, we have enough of that uh, as, uh, ethnicization of uh, the conflicts, we really need to have a government uh, which is effective, which does something for the people, improves. Uh, uh, life situations and so on, and for that we need specialists. And that was something which was uh, really kind of mobilizing votes for the gentleman who has now become the new president of Afghanistan, Dr. Ashraf Ghani, uh, who with his background in the World Bank and so on, and uh, having been a citizen of the US and knowing the culture of the West and uh, also how to deal with them, created a lot of hope that he would be someone who has the technical know-how and the, 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 even the academic know-how uh, to tackle, I mean, this biggest crisis of all, which is kind of uh, Afghanistan not being able to pay for itself uh, uh, in the moment and never have been in, in the past. And he also has published about that. You can find uh, his writings on the internet. Uh, that's quite interesting to read. The bad thing was in the, there was a second round because no one had 50% in the first round. And then the polarization also along ethnic uh, uh, lions again started and it was worse that there were so many irre irregularities in the elections, uh, there were no reliable institutions, um, no voter registry someone could uh, rely on, that there was a lot of fraud and then also Afghan institutions who insisted that they would run these elections themselves this time were not able really to in the end distinguish correct votes from uh, fraudulent votes and uh, actually we ended up with a non-result. Um, the Afghan official, Afghan administration's official line was a new president was named, and his name is Ashraf Rani. No one declared a winner or a loser because no one was actually able to say with sufficient uh, uh, conviction that Mr. Rani actually has won and Mr. Abdullah has lost. We simply don't know, and that's actually not a very good uh, note uh, for the Afghan international cooperation and institution building of the last 12-13 uh, years because I mean in a third electoral cycle you would probably expect that it is a little bit better and uh, I think there are also um, donor governments became a little bit victim of themselves that they of course are uh, um, happy to see when things are going in the, in, the, in the right direction and then probably not being critical enough when Things which were thought to be technical were not tackled because it's Afghanistan and it needs a while to develop, which is all correct, but uh, uh, there were a number of problems as I was alluding to, lack of a voter registry. We had uh, expectations that there might be around 15 million voters in Afghanistan, but you have 21 million registered voters, so there's somehow a gap and that's a gap big enough of manipulation. These things could have been sorted out earlier with a census or without the census with a, a, a voter registry. There were projects which then also were uh, undermined by the Afghan government uh, because they didn't want it, because there were people who thought that it's better to muddy the waters to be able to manipulate elections. And all that created a situation but also a mindset in which no one was really ready to believe in the election results as they, come, as they, they came about. And, and that's clearly for me an institutional crisis. Um, second, what also uh, uh, is important, 
and that's that's good at least in the short term that despite that violence did not break out with a lot of international involvement and also pressure both sides agreed to have a government of national unity to join forces and uh, leave this conflict behind hopefully i mean it's still simmering in the background and uh, it also i mean we cannot exclude that it flares up for uh, uh, some reasons um the problem there is that we don't that we now have a government which is the former governing camp plus the former opposition and there's almost no one at least visible left over in Afghanistan who can from outside criticize the government with a, a broader basis. It's not so that those people do not exist, but civil society in Afghanistan still is, uh, uh, it's developed but it is very fragmented and uh, over the past years with uh, also ethnically divisive politi uh, policies sometimes uh, from the government has partly been co-opted and have become also not really uh, neutral on things. Um, there are there were, were democratic groups who were quite active in the first years who never got international uh, uh, support and they are kind of marginalized and have given up and uh, or looked for other jobs and, and something like that and that really is something now which is missing because Afghanistan now with a broad government where almost everyone is in the government needs a little bit control from outside by people who also have some weight and uh, I think there our governments in the future who have like Sweden and also like Germany, EU have said we will continue supporting Afghanistan should uh, really emphasize uh, uh, on working with these people and making them strong. Um, another thing is now, I mean, we don't, we are very much in the beginning. Uh, the new president and, uh, has uh, uh, agreed with his former opponent to join into that uh, new government, Dr. Abdullah. Uh, the opponent is now something like a, a, a prime minister and in two years time they will uh, decide whether it should be like that and the constitution needs to be changed uh, or they will go back to the old system. I mean we are not able to say what will come out but a lot of that will depend whether the system works and uh, uh, it of course also does not, it depends very much on these two people who are strong personalities and they need to find a way to work with each other but of course also two people, they might be as good as they want, uh, will not be able to run a complicated country like Afghanistan who is facing all these kind of different crises, problems, challenges and so on. So what's very important is, and we are not there yet, how will the new cabinet look like? Who will be the new provincial governors in Afghanistan? Um, there are rumors, but that's not more than rumors, that all the names will change, which many Afghans would say it's a good thing, uh, but we also need to see that uh, this will not mean that the old power brokers which are there in the regions, in the, uh, in the capital, the former warlords, commanders and so on, will just go away and be happy when the new government is starting and uh, doing what it is saying, that they will establish better governance, uh, more effective government and so on. There will be a lot of pressure by people who made a lot of money, who have a lot of gained a lot of influence over the last 12 years, who are actually not interested in reforms and an effective government as long as the rent is coming in. And uh, uh, one of the first steps, and, and, and I said there's also a rent which you can raise by being involved in the war on terror. Uh, we all have been very interested in, in looking in uh, what Karzai has not done, the old president uh, and, and Ashraf Ghani and Abdullah have done now, signing the bilateral uh, strategic uh, agreement with the US and also the uh, one agreement with NATO, so to have a continuation of the NATO, of the NATO mission, that's a good thing more on the economic side because it also guarantees that uh, uh, the pipeline of uh, uh, aid and development money uh, and reconstruction money continuing to coming in uh, uh, is there. On the other hand, it's also a signal to the Taliban that the fight will continue um, because uh, they have made clear and, and we need to believe them unfortunately that they uh, that they will continue the fight until there's the last uh, foreign soldier has left uh, uh, Afghanistan so in Afghanistan very often it's very ambivalent to say whether something is good or something something is bad I mean it's stabilizing definitely for the government but it doesn't make sense to stabilize a government if it does not do what it now has announced again Karzai also has announced that before that they will do reforms and be more effective and so on we can only hope that it will be the case this time and that the investment, the additional investment into that government really will play out for something that, that actually livelihoods of, of Afghans are uh, improving and uh, security is improving. Saying that, this also means, that's my personal conviction and there are different people who have different opinions about that, um, 
The Taliban issue, of course, the insurgency in Afghanistan, the armed insurgency, is still a, a large problem. It's probably not the largest one, but it's one of the largest. Um, we have tried uh, with all our troops the last 12, 13 years to uh, uh, solve that problem militarily. Uh, it has not really worked for whatever reasons. Also, that will take another, not 20 minutes, but 20 days probably to discuss that. Um, <clears throat> but uh, uh, now there is some hope on the Afghan side that the Afghan security forces uh, uh, can do that. I'm a little bit uh, uh, pessimistic about that. Uh, which leads me to the conclusion, and that's open to discussion as everything what I'm saying, of course, uh, is that we need to start looking for a real political solution, which ends violence, which brings the Taliban in from the cold, make them a part of the whole thing without taking over Afghanistan again and bring it back to, to 13 years ago, what most of the Afghans, of course, don't want. But the thing is, it's not about wishful thinking and a good plan. Uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's not about wishful thinking, but about a good plan, and that good plan is not existing, and also not in the Afghan government. That's probably one of the most issues between, let's personalize it, Rani and Abdullah, that probably Rani as a Pashtun, also with his links to the old Karzai camp, and so is more inclined to talk with the Taliban and probably will do it, although we have not seen what this real plan is there, while most of the people who are with Abdullah are more and more deadly against talking with the Taliban at all. And they actually are putting a lot of uh, weight on strengthening their own security forces and uh, also praising them, which have raised the morale of their security forces also. Um, but I think this hope that this whole thing can be uh, uh, done militarily is, is uh, too optimistic, unfortunately. So what's really important is that the international community and the new Afghan government sit together and talk, talk these things through, what can be done, and that also in Afghanistan you need a, an open discussion about what really should be done. That will be very controversial, but it's important that not only the government has a unified policy, but that also a majority of the people believes that this is a good thing to do, whatever they decide. Um, how far am I in my time? Almost finished. So uh, then only one more thing uh, on the new government and in, in relation uh, with the economic and uh, social crisis Afghanistan is facing. A lot of it is about money. Of course, money is not the only solution, <clears throat> but it's clear that without money also the government cannot do anything. And for that, both the Afghan government and our governments need to work together to make the, the money which is still flowing in much more effective than it has been in the beginning. And that's actually very much up to the Afghan side because there are a lot of uh, uh, people uh, also related to government or even in the old government who have stolen a lot of money and uh, become very, very rich without, uh, 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 with impunity. Uh, um, and there was that uh, big case of the Kabul Bank, a private bank which was collapsing, $900 million uh, disappeared, over $700 million of them still unaccounted for. Um, that's a very symbolic case. Uh, Ashraf Rani, the new president, has opened the investigation into that. Um, that is also linked to people from the Karzai family, from the former vice president's family, other big shots. Um, if he can see that through, and for that he definitely will need our support and probably also protection, uh, because that's a real uh, uh, sensitive issue, uh, he might be able to set a signal uh, that he's really serious about what he's saying in the moment, but of course after 14 days you, 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 he has not really done a lot, but that should not of course be held against him and he should have the benefit of the doubt. Um, there's uh, also one thing, if you want to follow it, there's a group in Afghanistan it's called Sadrus 100 Days. They have a website which is in Dari, but I also think in, in, uh, uh, in English, where they follow the election promises which were made by both camps and then put that on, on the website and, and follow up on that. So that's also a very interesting source and uh, will help us to f find out. And, and uh, uh, maybe in 100 days we can say more in which direction this uh, government is going. So in that case, really, I, I hate that usually to say that the, the, gla the glass is uh, half full in the moment still. And uh, the hurdles are big, but uh, uh, it probably was half a year ago. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thomas, for that uh, thought-provoking uh, session. 20 minutes goes very fast. Huh? Yeah, we could have listened a lot longer to you. But next up is uh, Roger Carlson.